The Price of Fear. Vincent Price presents Michael Jaston, Sandra Clark, and Daphne Hurd in Goody Two Shoes by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. The story I'm about to tell you is a love story. If not a perfect love, at least the perfecting of it. Something difficult to achieve. Something which can often lead to disastrous, indeed horrific results. David and Anne Fordyce, Mr. and Mrs., both mid-thirties, they'd been married for five years, known each other for ten. They were, well, what you might say, meant for each other. Everybody said so. Attractive, personable, identical tastes, interests, meant. And yet, a feeling of growing apart was the way David eventually put it. The reason for this growing apart neither knew or even understood. Both finally blamed it, quite simply, on the rat race. They thought about it a lot. It preoccupied them. A need to get away out of the rut. A chance to find themselves and each other again. And they both believed it, really believed it. Once decided, the move wasn't difficult to arrange. David's credentials as a junior partner in one of the city's most reputable law practices, a fine mind, excellent connections, it was all there just for the asking. Their best friends, Charles and Victoria, said so at the time. They even said so after my little story was told. But at the time, there was no sense of sacrifice, of giving up anything. Anne was, quite simply, the most important thing in David's life. So fresh fields and pastures knew it had to be. The city chambers lost him to a small country practice their stylish Georgian Terrace house in London, to a temporary flat above the office in that distant market town in deepest Devonshire. And it was from there, every weekend, they'd drive deeper, ever deeper, into the surrounding countryside, in search of... Well, at the time, they'd both have found it impossible to put a name to that. It was late evening when we got that first glimpse of Ty's cottage. Just a glimpse at first. Briefly, between the hedges and high elms. Only the roof, really. Torn flat. No smoke rising from the lopsided old chimney. Neglected. But oh, strangely beckoning. Darling, hold on. Have a heart. You need a flamethrower to get rid of these brambles. Oh, it gets better once you find the path. It certainly couldn't get worse. What? You do realize we're trespassing. Whatever happened to your spirit of adventure? I left it at the gate. <laughs> oh, come on, then. Come on. Anybody at home? And if there were, I might be near you talk yourself out of it. <laughs> Hello? God, what a it's not exactly house and gardens. I'm whacked. There's a three-legged chair if you want a breather. Now where? Oh, the living room is huge. I'll take your word for it. Oh, open heart, eagle nook, a twisting little staircase. It's not very safe, but going right up to the bedroom. <sighs> Reluctantly, I have to take your word for that too. And love. Anne? Darling? Hmm? Now what are you pondering? Only the possibility. Come on, Anne, I'm starved, and it doesn't look as though we're going to get invited to dinner. What possibilities? Oh, only possibilities. There aren't any. Use your head. The, the roof leaks. But can be reset. That, that staircase. We'll obviously need a bit of fixing. But, but it's a positive slum. So what are an elbow greens, me old dearie? Um. You're not mad about the idea, are you? Um, you're obviously not. Well, you're quite right. It, 
It's getting late. Oh, to hell with that. It's just that you know, I thought getting away from it all was part of the general idea. We'd as good as settle for something on that new estate. Estate? Yes, there's always that. But who the hell wants to live in a boot box when there's the challenge of something like this? Challenge is right. Mm. Oh, please, David. It might not even be on the market. It might, though. Well, at least think about it, please. Mm -hmm. Please. Idiot. All right, I'll think about it. But for God's sake, don't set your heart on it. I already have. Anne needn't have worried. Ty's cottage was on the market. It had been for a very long time. And at the price, even David found it impossible to resist. They spent their first night there on a borrowed and very uncomfortable pair of camp beds and slept like a top. David, hardly at all. Breakfast was served amidst the debris of the old cottage colour. And just as I was dropping off, those damn birds started their manic twittering. <laughs> Piccadilly in the rush hour I can take, but those damn birds... Oh, not to worry, darling. You'll get used to it. Have to, won't I? God, look at the time. I must be off. <laughs> What's on the agenda? Soap, water, and elbow grease. Oh, can't do much else till the furniture gets here. Well, they did promise midday, latest. Yeah, uh, so we all know what that means. Anyway, I've arranged for a Mrs. Perkins from the village to come in and give me a hand. Mrs. Perkins? How rude. <laughs> Ain't it just so? Now, what about lunch and dinner? Oh, I'll pop in and do a shop once I've got things organized. Oh, don't worry, darling. When you get home, you won't know the old place. <laughs> Somehow, I think I might. And what happened? From the start, nothing but hitches. By midday, no furniture van and no reliable Mrs. Perkins. Anne decided to cut her losses. She left a note explaining her absence and set off across the fields to the village and the small general store. At least David wouldn't have an empty larder to add to the list of discomforts. It was early afternoon by the time she got back to the cottage and the surprise that awaited her. Not only had the furniture been delivered, but Mrs. P. had already got things very much in hand in the living room. The carpet down, the three-piece suite arranged very much as she would have chosen. And upstairs in the bedroom, her dressing table was just in the place that she would have chosen. Well, well, well. Clever old Mrs. Perkins. It wasn't until an hour or so later when that clever lady called up to her from the bottom of the stairs that she realized that something was amiss. Hello? Anybody on? Mrs. Fordyce. Yes. Oh, you're there then. Is that you, Mrs. Perkins? Give you a second. Oh, that could do it. Hello, Mrs. Perkins. Talk about the morass of centuries, hmm? I bet I hear late, Mum. Oh, you find it getting chilly? Just give me a hand to pull this tea pot in a bit, and we can slam the door on it. Oh, there. Oh, Ooh, that's better. That's a lovely old clock there, Mum. Yes, my husband will have to rebalance it. Come on through to the living room. Would you like some tea? Uh, no, thank you, Mum. It's no trouble. I, I hadn't mastered that stove, but we scrounged up a primus, so... No. Really? Uh, thank you, Mum. No. Well, later, then. I... Is something the matter, Mrs. Perkins? I just come to say how sorry I am, I am. Sorry? Well, Jack, that's my husband. He says no need. No need to go apologizing for something that's not really of your making, he says. But like I said, as far as that poor woman's concerned, all water under the bridge. None of it her doing. Will her not to know, I says. Least I can do is to get up there now and say I'm sorry I am for not being able to get here at all. Not able to get here at all? Mrs. Perkins, you did say... Come on up, then. Up? No. No, it's just that I had to go into the village for a few things. I left you a note, but 
If you've just got here, you won't know about the note. No, ma'am. Anyway, it all took rather longer than I expected. Down in the village, I mean. But when I got back, most of the furniture neatly stacked in the front garden. And... And this room. Arranged. Just as you see it now. I just took it for granted it was your doing, you see. Oh, my dear. Mrs. Perkins? My dear Laura. Oh, look, are you all right? Hey, oh, sit down for a minute. I, uh... There, there should be some brandy. I... No. I'm all right in a minute, ma'am. So, started already as she... She? I might have known. Should have expected it in view of what's gone afore. But it be in such a long time now since the last couple move out. Always townies. One foot inside the door and it's love at first sight. But no sooner settled than moving on again. And all is of a sudden like. Didn't they give a reason? Most locals never got that close. None of our business, was it? So what call us to ask the wise and wet for us? Just a moment ago, you said... Started again, has she? Did I mean she? You did say she. Two shoes. I'm sorry? Goody, two shoes. <laughs> now, you can smile. Just a name, Father. Good as any other. Nursery rhyme name. No telling for why they first give it to her. But when I were a little maid... I used to listen to the old ones talking in the village and telling the tale and smile. Just smile. Tell me about her, Mrs. Perkins. Huh? Oh, the right to know. The right to know. Well, abandoned on her wedding day at the church, according to your say. Oh, nothing so much thought in these days, but in goodies time. No, even now, possible to imagine the snidings and the wise and wherefores on every tongue. This cottage is already and prepared, seemingly. So tis here she come and stays and never ventures, swearing never to be seen again by another living soul. Out the night and in the day was what they reckoned. But not even the night poachers and the light ever caught a glimpse of her. From wedding day on, long dead when they finally notices no smoke from her chimney. Long, long dead. So no face to be put to her, even in death. But seems grave all arranged and paid for. Even something in her own hand wrote for her stone. Accept. The gifts I offer, accept them, come what may, but see but once their differ, and live to rue their day. How, how did you know that, ma'am? I don't know. But you've never even seen the grave, have you? No. No, I haven't. Mrs. Perkins. Oh, sorry, ma'am, I, I must leave you now. Oh, but please. You must. <laughs> And as Anne turned back into the passageway, something different. The tea chest had gone. It now stood on the landing at the top of the stairs. The bedding, if it contained, was already neatly stacked in what she'd only just decided should be her linen cupboard. Even before she'd opened the door, she knew it would be there didn't really worry her. She'd already decided not to tell any of it to David. And then, several weeks later... Abby? Need you ask? Just as... Well? As I always imagined it might be. More. Much more. Didn't I always tell you? The place had possibilities. I just hope you're not overdoing things, that's all. I've loved every minute of it. Wait, it's almost as though... Well... So we owed it something, which is why we came here. It meant. Now it's loving us back in return. Idiot. Dear idiot. <laughs> I'll just take these coffee things through. Is the woman from the village still coming in to give you a hand? 
No. N- not anymore, darling. Oh? So? Well, her husband was taken ill. Quite suddenly. She says she can't manage it anymore. When did she drop that on you? Oh, just recently. How recently? A week or so back. Then you'll have to look around for somebody else. No, we don't need anybody else. But... We don't, do you hear me? We don't, darling. Really, we don't. She didn't, of course. If there had been any initial terror, it had long passed. She'd grown to depend on her good fairy to take her for granted. It no longer even surprised her to leave the kitchen to return a few minutes later and find the dishes washed and stacked away, to find a fresh supply of logs in the polished hearth, freshly baked bread and cakes when she entered the pantry. If there was any motive in her continued silence, one had to look no further than David's praise of her. And yet, as the months passed, she felt the need of a wider, less captive audience. Their old friends, Charles and Victoria, proved the obvious answer. So when we got your invitation, Vicky and I had an each-way bet. No, such thing. <laughs> Don't fib, my love. Well, do tell, then. <laughs> Take my word for it, she said. Either they've decided to throw in the rural sponge, or... <laughs> oh, what? Oh, poor David's gone over the orchard wall on his own and is beseeching us to get the spare bedroom. Oh, kill him! <laughs> Not that far from the truth. Oh, do tell. Oh, come on, darling. Don't mind admitting it. But you already have them. Oh, I agreed with her getting away from it all and to hell with the rat race a bit. But uh, I wasn't too keen on ending up as a world war gummage while better half put on the old mop cap and got on with the jam making out back. Mm, <laughs> we did have our doubts. If you'd seen this place when we first set foot through the door... They'd have been more than justified. Bad as ever, sir? Worse. I still thank God for a telephone in the village and a hotel within striking distance, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> you see how it's all come out? Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, old sir. Just looking at the condition it's in now. It's just about six months, isn't it? Just. Just about. Hmm? Positive miracle. Yes. Yes, I suppose it must seem like a bit of a miracle. You all right, darling? <sighs> Fine. Everything's fine. I just felt a bit stuffy in here for a moment, that's all. Charles, Victoria, can I get you anything else? Oh, not another crumb for me, darling. You sentenced me to a six-month fast, as it is. Uh, some blow out there, old girl. Oh, superb. Hmm. <laughs> this is that country pie of yours. You know, I can't remember ever having sampled it before. <laughs> It'd be damn surprising if you had. Oh? Huh? Mrs. Beaton, did you say, darling? Oh, previous to that, kind sir. Have you so much previous to that? Come on. Well, can we share the dark secret? But there's no dark secret, Mum. It's common in these parts. Partridge, wood pigeon, lark, sweet Jenny Wren. If you've a mind to it. Cider soap truffle, dill, peppercorn, fennel, and butter marjoram that have stood one year around. Um. <laughs> First catch your lark, eh? <laughs> I wonder if we can order it from our local stationery. No. <laughs> uh, Anne came across an old recipe book when she was clearing out the attic. Receipt, my sweet dear. Receipt. God knows how long it had lurked there. Handwritten. Oh, fascinating. Crab like you'd never believe. Crab, you say? Well, it seemed easy enough for you. Anyway, before you could say Mrs. Beaton's grandmother, we've resurrected the old herb garden, flirted with the local gamekeeper, and I've been playing your 18th century guinea pig ever since. <laughs> You're not finding a fault, my sweet dear. So far from it. Um, shall I give you a hand with this? You don't stay out of there. You hear me? You hear well what I'm telling you? It is my place. Mine, no others. No damn call for her to go meddling in. You hear me? Anne. Oh. Darling. <laughs> Your face is so... It happened several months later. Summer had gone. Autumn was in the trees. Anne had started out to the village when she remembered her shopping list on the kitchen table. As she passed the half-drawn curtains of the living room windows, she caught her first glimpse of her. Small. 
Very small. Much older than I... Oh, how very old she looks. Not at all frightening, so. Such white hair. Pulled neatly into a tight bun at her neck. Made to seem even whiter, I suppose, by her long black dress. Reaching right to the ground. From any age. And yet, if I stretch just a little higher over the sill, I can just about see the stone floor. And on tiptoe, peering over the window ledge, Anne saw, peeping out from under the hem of the long dress, a pair of black kid shoes, polished to brilliance. On their front, two very large, silver, shiny buckles. Then Anne looked up. For just the briefest of moments, their eyes met. Then, the old lady was gone. Accept the gifts I offer. Accept them, come what may. But see but once their giver. And live to rule the day. For God's sake, darling, haven't you made a move mm -hmm. yet? Oh. Here. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Have to be a beaker, I'm afraid. Come to that, about the only clean crock in the house. What? And why the hell didn't you let me give you a hand with the dinner things? Dinner things? Your gourmet speciality certainly goes through one hell of a lot of pots and pans. It's ruddy chaos down there. But I did. What? No, nothing. They won't take me long. The way things are going lately, it'd be a damn sight better if we cleared the decks before we turned in. On top of which, that damn cat must have knocked the sugar bowl over. It's all over the ruddy place. The fire won't catch because the sticks are damp and it rained in the night. Uh -huh. So one of us seems to have left the living room window off the catch. Oh, hell, love. I don't even have a clean shirt. It was that first morning Anne began to realize things were not as they had been that something was amiss. Much as she tried, the shambles continued. The more she tried, the worse it got. Untidiness became chaos. Chaos turned to filth. She tried, but could do nothing to prevent it. Nothing, my dear darling David. Nothing in the world. Simply too much. Out of my hand. See? You see? But why, love? Why? The change. There must be some reason. Beyond reason, my old dearie. <laughs> All right. Perhaps I shouldn't have depended on you so much. <laughs> Taking things for granted. <laughs> if that's why. <laughs> if it's something that can be put right. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, damn you. Give me that. <laughs> Don't laugh. my doing. I should have told you before. Confided in you. But you suddenly grown so proud of me. Too proud. See? I grown to depend on it. She she must have realized that. Counted on that. Right? From the very first moment we walked through those doors. All those long years before. Just waiting for us. Who, my love? Her. But I don't understand. No. No, you, you could never understand. Too late to understand. Oh, hold me closer. Oh, please hold me. Saw her, you see? Just that once. But I should never have done that. It was the briefest glimpse. But I should never have caught her. She hated me for that. That evening, even as David walked up the path, he sensed a change in the place. The smoke curling up from the chimney... The brass knocker again worked to a brilliant shine, just as he'd remembered it. 
Um. Um. Um, you what, bro? It was in the kitchen he found her, dear Anne. She was wearing her favorite dress. She was smiling at him, so tender and sweet a smile, as she swung gently back and forth from the heavy oak beam. There was one other detail David took in, in that first horrendous moment. The chair she must have climbed on and then jumped from was back in its usual place, below the recently polished window. And then beneath the chair, something as incongruous as it was bewildering. A pair of shoes of the old-fashioned kind. Much too small for Anne, tiny. Low-heeled, kid leather, polished to brilliance. And in the front... Two heavy, silver, shiny buckles. And reflecting in their shine, the swinging court. David married again. The new Mrs. Fordyce was quite the opposite of Anne. Sophisticated, poised, almost glossy. She ran her own advertising agency far too well for her male competitors. On the domestic front, and only in a crisis, she could just about manage to top up a coffee percolator. Thatch cottages gave her hay fever. And yet the match seemed to work well enough. <laughs> David probably prefers it this way. That was Goody Two-Shoes, starring Michael Jaston as David Fordyce, Sandra Clark, Anne, and Daphne Hurd, Mrs. Perkins, with Francis Jeter, Victoria, and Nigel Graham, Charles. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dyer.